I was inculcated with um, you know, morality at school, um, at home. Uh, my household environment was generally, my mom was very permit, permissive of myself, permissive, so she wasn't too strict on, my, on me, but my father was more strict on myself than my mom. Um, and it, it was, mostly because he was very protective, and, uh, and my, my father had that kind of um, paranoia that something would happen to his kids, some stranger would uh, pop out from nowhere and hijack me and whatever. Or, or my brother. So in that situation, that was kind of the situation in which I grew up. A typical Londoner um, child in, at primary school, which is where the events take place. And for one reason or another, when I was learning about well, my first encounters with different religions, um, especially uh, like you know, Muslim, which I didn't really know much about apart from don't eat pork and something about a guy called Muhammad. So that was pretty much the, the scope and limit of my understanding about Islam at the time. Uh, but for me, I just thought Christianity it was basically the, the basic truth which I lived by. I wasn't so much of a practicing Christian, but Christianity doesn't, modern Christianity does not have any law system. There's no uh, comprehensive law. So what the, how do you define a practicing Christian is very, it can, it's subject to difference of opinion. But I was, certainly very, I was certainly very devout, and I had a fear of hell. I was always motivated by this uh, you know, fear of hell. It didn't stop me from doing bad things as a kid, but I had a guilty conscience most of the time. So that, that was one thing. Then at some point when I reached uh, about n 9 or 10 years old, I, a question popped into my head. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how or where it came from, but when I was n learning about different cultures around the world, I asked myself a simple question. Is my religion dependent on my geography? So is it where I live or where I come from, some accident of birth, some accident of location, uh, culture, immigration, whatever, that determined what I believe and what is the truth? And I thought, well, that can't be. That sounds absurd. If I was born in India, would I be a Hindu? If I was born uh, elsewhere, I'd be a Muslim or a, a Buddhist or uh, any other, or Rastafarian, if I was born in Jamaica. Well, not all Jamaicans are Rastafarian. It's a misconception. So, what, is it geography that determines your belief? And I thought, that can't be the case. I have to find out. But then, I, obviously, Christianity is actually an exclusivist religion. So, other religions, if you follow another religion, then you're you know, destined to hell, you're going to burn in hell. Although there are some more pluralistic uh, Christian interpretations in the modern world, but traditionally, that was the case. And I, got, I became very paranoid about following falsehood or following something that might not be true and then paying for it in, in an afterlife. And so I made my first deal with God. And I remember it was a strange, I don't know if it was a supplication or, or, or some kind of prayer, I just said to God that, because I always believed in God, I always, that was unquestionable in my mind, but I said, I don't want to offend you God by following something that's true, uh, untrue, sorry, I don't want to offend you God by following something that uh, is incorrect or was made up. So I'm not going to, I'm going to leave Christianity. I'm going to depart from my religion. I'm going to still believe in you, but could you please show me, uh, you know, show me the truth and I'll follow it. I promise I will follow it. And whatever that truth might be, uh, I will tell it to the world as best as I can. Now, when I was 10 years old, I, I was very naive. And I thought to myself, because it, it's very uh, culturally accepted that there's one question that no one can answer, which is, what is the meaning of life? Right? Everyone talks, there's like, uh, Monty Python did a whole film about it. And that, everyone just accepted that, what's the meaning of life? A question that can't be answered. So I took that, I just took that on face value and I believed in it. And there were different religions and different beliefs and perspectives. So I, I said to myself, maybe no one knows what the truth is, yet. So maybe if I study all these religions and all these belief systems and every perspective that you can imagine, and I put it all together, I can work out what the truth is and then tell it to the world. Like me, a 10-year-old boy, is going to achieve something that humans haven't done for thousands and thousands of years. And so as you can tell, I was just a little bit naive as, as a young kid. So I embarked on my study. I, went, I found any book I could find from the local library with about any religion that you can imagine. Uh, Jainism, Buddhism, uh, 
different sects of Christianity, cults, Wiccans, white black magic practices, Rastafarianisms, believe it or not, Mormons, Moonies, atheism, uh, and uh, you know the, the science, which was a bit quite interesting. There's no connection between atheism and science, by the way. But uh, science was interesting because science always seemed to give answers, and I was looking for answers. And so science was promised it gives answers, and so I thought, okay, I'll use that as, as a means to find answers for um, my, my purpose. And Buddhism had some resonance with myself as well, because in Buddhism, it you know, believes in, in a search for truth, in a search for enlightenment. So I thought that Buddhism could possibly offer me some aspects, some key uh, ingredients required for my journey to find this, this truth. And all the while around me, at the time, in the, it was, this was in, in the 90s, in the early 90s, there was this you know, massive you know, backlash or, or, uh, against racism at the time. So there was a lot of liberal campaigns ongoing against racism. And it got so fanatical at the time that um, people who weren't racist or weren't being racist, even in my class, uh, got paranoid that they were racist. And for example, a friend in my, in my class was looking at some um, black and white cartoons in a newspaper and to delineate a, a, a person of brown skin or black skin they had lines drawn, shading lines, every artist knows the shading lines and the guy said, oh they've got these lines on this person's face, that, that's racist and it's like, they were going absolutely paranoid and I started to kind of take a step back from society at the same time and I, and I saw that there was something terribly wrong about the society I was living in, that, that you know, humans seem to be prone to paranoia, to, to making each other miserable in that society, that people have the freedom to make each other miserable, uh, to frustrate each other, to compete with each other, you have to fit into social norms, and fine, I could fit into those social norms, but I start asking myself a question, why should I fit into those social norms? How do I know that's the right way to live? It doesn't make people any happier. People uh, seem to be, uh, you know, in a chaotic mess and hurt, you know, hurting each other, affecting each other, being selfish, self-centered. Uh, it was a lot of questions. I was questioning both what is the truth, what is out there, what is the meaning of life, and also how should we live as human beings, what is the purpose of, how do we organize ourselves, and, you know, how do we manage the, that crazy chaotic animal called the human being. So I was asking all these kind of questions at that time, and I became more and more aloof from my classmates, and I became more and more aloof from, I suppose, the common uh, enjoyments of, of, of that society, being a young kid and doing the things that young kids do. Because it, they started to become mundane, the world became a bit more mundane for, my, for me. It, it seemed that the more I participated in society, uh, following what I was told to do, or what was, I was meant to be doing, the more I forgot about these questions and didn't see their importance. And no one seemed to ask the same question as me. I, I, it was strange. I thought something, something wrong with me. Everyone is thinking about how to live their lives, you know, what choice they should make in what career or profession. No one ever asked themselves why they are living. It's, it's strange. You thought that was the most basic question. If you woke up on a desert island, you didn't know how you got there, and you didn't know what's, you know, what, what's around you. you, the first question you said, like, what am I doing here? How did I get here? Now, what, what's my purpose here? What am I doing here? No one asks themselves the question. Everyone just accepts what society tells them is what you should be doing. You should be enjoying life, living life to the max, uh, you know, a very self-centered view. This is in obviously the modern Western context. And it was that that I started to have some issues with. Now, to be fair, a lot of my personality at the time was a product of the society I, I was born into. I was a product of that society. You know, I, I had the same viewpoints to as, as a lot of a lot of people, the, the right and the wrong and the good and the bad and, and so on. This was it was very similar, but I just started to ask questions. And I started to go through the religions, because the religions I thought was a good place to start. Religions trying to give you a why, you know, explain why things exist, what you're doing here and so so I thought, okay, I'll start with that, and that eventually when I know what the why is, then I can go to how society could be organized to be better because it didn't feel right. Something was about society was it wasn't natural. There was something human beings weren't meant to be in this circumstance. It wasn't natural. So I went through the religions. I went through Christianity. It, Christianity had many 
uh, obviously things, ideas it postulated. I had left all these ideas behind, such as, you know, death, resurrection, um, you know, the miracles or the, fl the flood of Noah and all these, all these, I left all these, these ideas behind thinking that they were similar to, you know, Greek mythology at the time. I just thought it's just Greek mythology. Uh, Greeks had also some, you know, very, what appeared to be strange ideas about ma magic and miracles and things. So I, I thought, okay, there's nothing to substantiate Christianity and it doesn't seem to be giving any um, higher laws or things uh, to, to mankind, no special secret that would explain existence. So I moved on and I went to Buddhism thinking obviously that I said Buddhism has this kind of desire to find be enlightened and work out what your purpose in life is. But then, I, then I, it occurred to me, Buddhists say that the purpose of your life is to be enlightened. And to be enlightened is to work out the meaning of life or the, your purpose of life. But isn't that circular? So the, the purpose of life is to work out my purpose in life. But I really know my purpose in life, but I, but I don't. And, and it, it seems to be circular. And also this karmic system, they didn't believe in, in a god, but they believe in a system of karma where if you do bad deeds, it, you know, it comes back to you at some point in this life or the next, or other or, 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 or or the lives. And if you do good deeds, that will, you know, that will come back to you in this life or, or the next. But what I didn't understand is who, invent, who instituted that system in the Buddhist worldview? Who's monitoring it? Who's checking it? And who's you know, delivering you back your bad karma you did or delivering back to you the good karma? Who's checking it and why is it there? And also ideas such as that human beings or, or our soul um, originally is our divine or came from, from a higher being or possibly, uh, which is actually sorry, a, Hindu, sorry, a Hindu understanding. Uh, and there are various shades of Buddhism and Hinduism where they overlap. And in the Hindu understanding, uh, which also believes in seeking enlightenment and, re and reincarnation, they believe that basically we come from God and we are all split into the will, parts of God, and we have to go back to God. So our aim is to seek enlightenment that will bring us back to God. But my question was, why did God split up into different pieces? Why are we all ignorant? God's all-knowing, or has infinite knowledge, so why are we ignorant? And why do we have to come to a realization of something to go back to, to our former state. It didn't make no sense. It was, there was no explanation. It was just, well, yeah, this is what we believe. And say, like, yeah, but I don't see how, I don't see why, I don't see how God can become ignorant and split into different parts. It didn't, didn't make any sense. So I left that one behind, although that was actually much later in my life. And then I came to all these different, you know, cults and um, beliefs about magic and uh, black and white magic and Wiccan beliefs and various pagan cults. And again, it just seemed like, you know, Greek myth mythology. And again, I was, at this time, I was in my secondary school, so this is around 12 years old. And I was starting my, you know, science classes uh, at the secondary level. And I was reading, you know, GCC level books on physics, which I absolutely loved. And I, I thought science will give me some, some answers. And... I believed, actually funnily enough, I believed in God, but I believed the universe was eternal because that's what scientists, scientists had told me. And it was very strange at the time, looking back at it, because scientists didn't show me an experiment that said the universe is eternal. They didn't show me, you know, how they worked it out or some mathematical equation they used to get to that, you know, understanding or that concept. Instead, they just said it, and we all trust scientists. In, in our society. <laughs> like, they wouldn't lie. They never get anything wrong, apart from everything in, in physics up until now. So, steady state theory for the universe, where the, they actually believe the universe has always been like this, was popular among scientists. There was a consensus of scientists in the mid 20th century that was refuted by evidence for the Big Bang. That got thrown out the window. You know, Newtonian physics, believed for hundreds of years, got thrown out the window by uh, relativity and uh, Einstein's discoveries. And of course, quantum mechanics has caused more trouble for uh, scientists uh, who had hold on to previous opinions. So, uh, but I didn't know this. I was led to believe, like most people living in the West, that scientists know the truth. And people listen to Stephen Hawking talk about God and talk about, he doesn't know. How would he know about God? Or how would he know about the age of, of, uh, of the multiverse? Even the idea of a multiverse with there's, there's infinite universes, there is no empirical proof for it at all. There's no, it's not mathematically deduced. It's not inferred from any experiment or any mathematical equation. It's literally an explanation that atheist scientists came up with to avoid 
the requirement for a starting point, a initiator, a creator. But I didn't know that at the time. I believed it. It took actually uh, me into my teenager when I became a teen uh, that I actually realized that uh, there was no proof of that at all. And it was quite strange. I, I believed in science. Um, so this made me unpopular in class because I'd always basically, you know, uh, speak out and say, but why is this wrong? And everyone looks at me like, how dare you question this? This is wrong. Why are you being such a, you know, a fuss pot? Why are you being, um, you know, the, uh, the black sheep? And I wasn't scared to say my opinions, um, and it got me into trouble. And I ended up having lots of fights uh, with, with, with people. And they were almost initiated by, by them. I, I actually never initiated a single fight in my, in my life. Um, but I, I just had to finish those fights when they were initiated. Uh, but the teachers always thought that I was the aggressive one because every time there was a fight, I was involved, it seemed. Uh, but it wasn't my fault, um, so I said. Now, I, I suppose then this propelled me to more research and propelled me because I, cause basically I wasn't fitting into society. I, I, put, I, you know, I put that on myself because I, I made that choice. I thought I'm not going to follow something blindly. But I didn't have any guidance. I had nowhere to you know, turn, know how to live, what I was living for. Um, my father told me I should be an ambitious, high-flying executive. Um, and that was the done thing. We, we used to live in a kind of um, you know, middle class way, even though we weren't middle class. But apparently in England, middle class is a mentality, not actually a, a, a economic class. In, in America, you have to have a certain pay grade to be middle class. In England, it's just how you act. So if you lift your pinky up when you drink tea, you're middle class. And um, so my father was propelling me to be very ambitious and to be a, you know, a successful businessman of some kind. And he acted like he acted that part. So I had, I, I, and I, again, I was, I was believing that until I became a bit, a bit more older and I decided that there was nothing substantial about it. I, I, I'd be, I mean, I always have to earn money and uh, you know, provide for myself, but I wasn't going to be defined by how my father would define me. I wasn't going to be defined how society would define me. And the person who helped me a lot through all this was actually my mum. Because my mum wanted, um, just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to do anything you know, wrong, but she wanted to give me enough space so that I would become what I, whatever I wanted to become. So I think many converts, when you hear many convert stories, they say, oh, you know, my parents reacted very badly when I became a Muslim, and it was very difficult. Uh, in some cases, they get persecuted uh, by their own family when they convert to Islam. Uh, in fact, uh, a friend of mine once said that uh, his parents uh, said that, I don't mind if you're, uh, if you're even uh, Rastafarian or, or gay or whatever, which was viewed as taboo by, by a lot of parents, as long as you're not Muslim. And that's, that was the case. So we were basically worse than um, you know, religions which are obscure or a sexuality which is considered to be taboo uh, at that time. So, so there I was. Um, and my mum was very supportive. But my mum, you know, it wasn't going to, she didn't believe in Islam, so she wasn't going to encourage me to be a Muslim. But my, the day I became a Muslim, I always remember it. And it wasn't highly eventful. And in, in essence, I didn't even know you had to say your shahada. So when, it, when you become a Muslim, you must make a testimony of faith. I, didn't, I thought, when I read it in Islam, I thought it just meant that you had to believe that testimony of faith. I didn't know you had to actually make an official declaration uh, to become a Muslim. And so my shahada day was basically me going up to my mum in my house, actually in the corridor, and saying, Mum, you know, I think I'll be a Muslim. And she's like, all right, dear, whatever. And, and like a passing fact, you know how parents are with their kids. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're a little soldier. That's great. Or you're a fireman. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, and they thought, oh, it's a you know, passing fact, just a passing fact. Um, 16 years later, I don't think she uh, thinks it's a passing fact anymore. But that, in essence, that was actually when I was 14. Now, I know you, you might think, but Abdullah, you haven't told us how you actually came into Islam, what persuaded you. It was actually a very gradual thing. You know, you become a Muslim, and then you realize you become a Muslim. That's how it works. It's not like you become, you know, you, uh, you realize you, you know, to, that you must be a Muslim, then you convert. It's rather you realize at a point that you're already a Muslim, and then you convert into Islam. And that's what most converts are. You actually already are a Muslim by the time you convert. I didn't, know yet to, I didn't know about the Shahada at the time, as I said. 
But I, when I encountered Islam initially, so I'm going to rewind the clocks from that point of my Shahada day to about a year. I, the first thing I encountered about Islam was, I mean, obviously, it believed in one God. It was very uh, simple. And I thought, because Islam is so simple, it doesn't have much truth in it. There must be something secret. There must be a secret truth that we, you know, no one knows. Like, like in Buddhism, it promises a secret truth. And this is what, you know, a true religion will tell you the secret truth, or a true way of life will tell you the secret truth. And Islam just seems to be just like, yeah, you know, God made us, and we're here to worship him. There you go. And, the five, and there's five pillars of what you practice. Well, but that's too simple. It's too simplistic. No, no, no it, it, Islam can't be the truth. There must be something deeper I'm not seeing here. And then one day I bumped into just this one concept. At that time, there wasn't this, uh, you know, hatred against the Sharia or Muslims as much as it is today. In fact, at that time, there wasn't you know, much known about Islam. And the media weren't demonizing Muslims uh, as heavily as they were you know, demonizing them now. So at that time, all I knew about Islam uh, in, in its kind of overt manner was just the woman's hijab. That's all I knew about, about Islam. And at the same time, and you might think, what's this got to do with my talk? I was, there was a series on TV called Ali McBeal. Now you're thinking, how the hell am I going to connect Ali McBeal to Islam and my conversion story? Well, I thought to myself, why does Islam want women to wear hijab? What's the purpose? What's it trying to achieve? I mean, religion, as I was told by my society, is a spiritual matter. So why is Islam now putting forward a, a, a social political regulation? What was it trying to achieve with this? It's very odd. I, I don't see religion doing that. And so I thought about it. I, and I, I, this is how I work. I, keep try, I try to think about it until it makes sense. And then it occurred to me, because I was watching Alan McBeal. Maybe not, not the time I was watching Alan McBeal. And I, that's my, my dark secret. I, I watched Alan McBeal when I was younger. I've since repented from that. I, uh, I realized Alan McBeal was all about sexual politics in the office. It was all about sexual tension, and it's all funny. It's uh, about how that, that, these hilarious situations play out with, with sexual tension in the office. And I realized something that it seems to me that what Islam is trying to look at or try to achieve is to eliminate sexual tension and sexual politics from society so that people could go out into society and work and do their job and not have to think about uh, you know, how they're going to chop their, their workmate or how they're going to uh, seduce uh, their boss or their secretary or whatever. I thought, you know, yes, the office isn't for sex. What a radical idea. And that's what um, it hit me, that Islam actually was trying to do something good in society. And I thought, if we have a purpose in life as human beings, then surely this purpose in life must address every aspect of human life. You know how secular you know, society tells us that, uh, yes, religion, religion over here, human life over there. You know, so your, how you live your lives, your society, your, your government, well, all, these, all these political issues are detached from religion. So how we live our life is detached from why we are living and why we are living our lives. Makes no sense. It doesn't, I don't know why people accept this, but it's accepted truth. And I thought, I believed that until Islam pointed out to me that you believe in a purpose, this purpose has ramifications for every aspect and every level of uh, human existence. And then it piqued my interest. If Islam says something good like that, what else does Islam say? I'm curious. And my natural, uh, my natural state is that I was of a skeptic. Um, so the reason why I, I went through all these different religions, uh, researching it and discounting it, was I was trying to find things to discount. Because I was trying to eliminate the, inc the inconsistencies and falsehoods and find what is the truth. And so I approached Islam the same method. I tried to find holes and gaps and inconsistencies in Islam. Man phenomena of nature that Islam doesn't explain or can't explain, or it seems that you know, nature is bigger or grander than, than Islam could encompass or provide a narrative for. But it seemed in every situation, in every aspect that Islam addresses, it made sense, it fitted together with its sort of holistic worldview, and it seemed to explain human existence. I, I, I'll, I'll explain further. We have free will. 
right? We have the ability to choose. No, inanimate objects like the table and the chair don't have the ability to choose. So, if God exists and He made us, then He must. There must be something significant about our ability to choose, related to what He intends for us to do. So, whatever our purpose in life is, it must be connected with our ability to choose. So, what does God want us to choose? And of course, you know, we live and we work uh, within within life's affairs, and everything in the universe, uh, like human beings, everything in the universe has laws, like laws of physics. I, I told you I like physics. So I really, you know, inanimate objects have laws, we have laws, a natural law of human existence, if you will. So, surely then, there must be a relationship between our natural law of what science should be intended for us and our ability to choose. And it seemed, and then Islam said that God created us to worship Him, to submit to the, law, uh, uh, to, to our, the laws intended for us, like everything in creation submits to its natural laws. So we have a natural law about human, human beings in, in created, uh, well, part of our creation, and we should submit to this natural law uh, so that, uh, in, to sanctify the creator who made us, because everything in creation fulfills its natural law, and hence is a, uh, it echoes the, the, um, the might and the glory of the creator who made them. And it seemed to make sense all these aspects were, were very, were actually mind-blowing, and they seemed to make sense. So we were not here, I was told by liberalism, to, by the, the, the state ideology, that the purpose of life is to enjoy life. Your purpose of your life is to enjoy it. I was told this, I believed it, I was self-centered, I was selfish. But, but the, how the culture is, I have to pretend that I'm not selfish, but uh, I, I was, like, everybody, like everyone else I knew. And of course, when you know in these in these comedies that you watch on TV, when uh, people act selfishly and it, everyone laughs at it because you're not meant to do it openly, you're not meant to openly declare that you're selfish. You've had a self-centered.